Gotcha. All right, so without further ado, uh, let's hear it for Cameron Cairns. Hello, thanks everyone for coming. Um, so just really quickly about me, uh, CTO at Pepper, we do um, nutrition analytics for uh, restaurant menus. So a lot of our uh, work right now is involving um, trying to find out the kind of nutrition data of both like large restaurants and smaller restaurants. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that in the examples. Um, so yeah, I've been learning how to scrape websites. So this is just kind of me trying to distill that in a 10-ish minute talk, we'll see. Um, my background's not in uh, data science. My background's in web development. Um, that does help in some ways, but in other ways I'm very um, helpless in this new, this new field. Definitely trying to get to grips with it, so. So here's some of the goals we have today, uh, just definitions, uh, legalities, fundamentals, tools, um, and then hopefully some time for questions at the end. So what, what is web scraping? So um, it's basically extracting the information from either a website, really just like an online resource. I, I wanna be kind of vague about that because I think a lot of people think of web scraping as extracting data from HTML, but it's just as valid and I think going on in the future, we're, we're gonna be extracting data from JSON responses instead, just because everything's moving to um, client-side rendered uh, websites, which is, you're gonna have like the skeleton of the JavaScript and then data getting um, hydrated on the page. So you'll be looking for those JSON responses. And we'll have an example of that later on. Um, the other thing is web crawling, and that's really more just trying to find the resources to scrape. Um, often you'll start a web crawl with a, like a seed, so like uh, there might be like a URL that's a, um, we don't have link farms anymore, but you'll have like a web page that has other links to other websites that might be good resources. So you'll use that as a seed and you probably will scrape that site as well to actually extract the initial URLs. Um, and then you just kind of keep going from there. Um, web crawling is not necessarily, um, it's not really like deterministic when it's going to complete. You're gonna wanna do something like limit how deep your, your crawl goes. So, you, you know, you might have a crawler that will um, find the first website that, that has like, that said, finds the first link that has like food in the, uh, the title of it. Um, you might only want to do that six times because it, it spiders out pretty quickly and it can take a really long time to resolve all of those um, requests. So um, that's kind of what, you know, the Googles of the world are doing. Um, the legalities around this is very gray. Um, I want to be, Really explicit about that. Um, I'm not a lawyer. Um, that work at a legal company. That's the one point. But anyway, um, not a lawyer. Uh, so just always check. Um, the most recent legal decision was actually in I think October of last year. So this is this is still very fresh and changing a lot. So um, not too long ago, web scraping was pretty bad. It was pretty. It wasn't hard. It was pretty hard to justify it. Um, in no salt two versus the United States, um, basically some employers um, started at a competing business while also working at the employer, and um, they got sued because they're using their login to basically extract all the um, the data that company had. Um, and then they use it to seed their new competing business. Um, it's a great test case for people that don't want people to scrape because it's pretty hard to defend someone, you know, doing that sort of thing. So the uh, court uh, ruled against them. So it was, you know, against scraping. Um, Facebook Inc. versus Power Ventures. I guess Power Ventures had like a dashboard where you could manage all your social media platforms. And um, because it was behind a login, once again, um, even though you maybe authorized Power Ventures to manage your social media profile, uh, the courts ruled against uh, Power Ventures from scraping Facebook because it was um, like private data. So. There's that, so, but, but we've got this new one that just came out in October, High Q versus LinkedIn. So in this one, the uh, Ninth Circuit Court ruled that uh, if it's publicly accessible um, and not otherwise like copyrightable, um, it seems fair game. Um, this is kind of why LinkedIn started putting up a paywall, so not a paywall, a login wall <laughs> recently because uh, of this uh, ruling. Um, so, I would say right now, like if there's a login, um, if there's a login, maybe don't do it, but if there's no login, it's maybe fair game. Once again, you know, do, do your own research. Um, it's very complicated. I'll, I'll post this slides uh, on the meetup page afterward. 
these are all links to the decisions, so you can read those and, and you know, educate yourself about that. Um, and yeah, copyright still applies. Um, you don't get away from copyright just because you're scraping their site. Um, so for us specifically, uh, recipes are not copyrightable, which is interesting. Um, the descriptions around how, like the recipe, like, oh, this was my grandmother's favorite recipe, that's copyrightable. But the actual like contents of the recipe is not. Um, so like generally like facts are not copyrightable. Um, there's a pretty good article from Scraping Hub here I've linked, so please read that. Um, I'm not gonna tell you what really is good or bad because once again, it's, it's super uh, sticky, I think, so. Okay, so now you know the whole legal uh, thing to be uh, careful about. Oh, you mind holding this microphone? Um, I'm gonna do some live coding. How much time do I have, like 10 minutes? Yeah. Oh, we have a lapel mic uh, available as well. Uh, sure. <clears throat> okay, so um, I could just, just yell, maybe. Can everyone hear me if I just yell? No? Okay. So, um, so the first step in uh, scraping a website is gonna be to actually look at the website and try to see where the data you wanna scrape is located. So I'm gonna do some kind of live inspecting here. Uh, my browser of choice is Firefox, but others like Chrome or Brave or whatever else is out there right now. now. Um, so uh, here's uh, a and Food. I want to scrape their nutrition information. So I'm gonna go to their burger section. And we got these great, look at these great burgers. So juicy. Right, not being paid by a and &W. Oops. Okay, so. <laughs> Makes you want to drink root beer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the first thing is I'm gonna open up the inspector. So um, you know, just right click. Uh, Chrome's got developer tools, I think is what it's called. Um, and what you'll notice here is they do have the nutrition information on the website. Um, now what I like to do uh, to kind of find out where the things are in the HTML soup here is uh, just kind of search the HTML for specific things. So like I see 550 calories, and I've got it here, right? Perfect, 550. So this is sort of what you're gonna be doing as a web scraper. Um, you're gonna be going to, especially if you have like specific content you're looking for, you're gonna go to that website and you're gonna see, all right, what's the general pattern? So I see 550 is there, 442 is here. That's an even more specific number, even better. Okay, so I've got this class called Nutrition Fact. Uh, it's got a span next to it called Calories. So this is the sort of things you wanna be looking for. So, uh, the next thing. So, how do you select it programmatically, right? So, um, we've got CSS selectors and we've got XPath selectors. So, uh, CSS selectors will be more familiar for those who've used uh, jQuery before. Um, it's a little bit simpler. It's not as perform. Uh, it's not as flexible, I would say, as the, the next one I'm about to show you. Um, the biggest caveat, well, two caveats, was that you can't select the parent of an of a element once you have that element, and you cannot select by the content of the element. So let's say, uh, for my example, there might be a like section of a page called nutrition facts. That's pretty important for me, right? So with CSS selectors, I can't look for the actual text nutrition facts. Ho hopefully the JavaScript developer has put a little like class on there called like nutrition dash facts or something and that's how you can get it. But that's not always the case, unfortunately. Um, and that is where arguably the better selector is. So XPath, um, I believe it has to do with like uh, X, XML. Yes, this is an XML selector, but it works with HTML, so, so it's good. Um, so yeah, you can use actual uh, content. So I could look for like find a H2 element with the text nutrition facts. Totally able to do that. Um, it has pretty sophisticated relational selection. You can like select the parent, uh, the, the, the next sibling, the previous sibling. Um, CSS selectors do have some of that, but it's not as um, sophisticated. So um, I, I'd put little links on, yeah, thanks. I'd put little links about where you can learn more about each of the selectors. Thank you, Mahmoud. Uh, right, and here's some examples of what it would look like. <laughs> right, so um, if I want to do like a CSS selector, Can you increase the font, Cameron? Oh, 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 it's not, not, not big enough. I can see it really well on my computer here, but obviously, <laughs> obviously not enough. Is that a little bit better? I can do one more. Yeah? So I also use this like low, uh, you know, solarized. Anyways, okay, so 
Um, yeah, this is actually going through quite a few at a time. So just like kind of give you an idea. So like I'm looking for like a div element whose class is nutrition facts list. Um, so what I'm trying to do right now is select um, the like the, the, the fat off of this burger, right? So I've got total fat here. So with CSS is a little bit more awkward. I have to be like, okay, I know that the fat is the second div element in this selection. Uh, so that's what I'm saying is a little bit more, it, it, it's simpler to look at, but it's more awkward when it actually comes to using it. You have to do a lot more like, it's very specific, uh, more fragile, like uh, scraping. Um, with XPath here, you can just look for the text total fat and then um, you know, know that it's sibling is right there. Um, it'll be just generally less uh, fragile when it comes to building scrapers. You're not going to update it as often because let's say they decide to nest that nutrition element just one more layer down. Suddenly all of your CSS selectors are broken. Not great, but with XPath here, um, it's, a very, it's a very general selector. I'm just looking for any span on the page, any descendant of the root node whose text has total fat. That's probably not going to change uh, super freq as, as frequently as say like the specific index of that, um, of where fat is located on the page. Um, and then you can do some fancy stuff. Um, I wasn't doing this all live, but I'm running out of time, I think. So um, it's a, I think it's a little bit more Pythonic in that like now I can say, what keys am I looking for? Well, I've got calories, total fat, carbs, and that's all on the page. And I can do this nice little like comprehension here with a nice F string. Um, rather than I guess doing like a little bit more awkward, I think I'd have to like increment nth child here of two to be one to one to four, I think is the actual like positions in the list. Um, so I, I would, uh, TLDL is uh, learn XPath. I think it's actually worth the um, kind of little bit of a steeper learning curve. You can get a lot more um, precise uh, selections that way and it'll just make your process much better. Um, how much time do I have? Which is, you know, a more uh, modern website like than than a uh, hand view, arguably. Um, and so we've got a new part of the uh, web tool open here. We've got the network tab. So a uh, funky thing about the network tab, you have to have it open for it to work. So you can't, like, you can't have just opened the site already and then inspect it to get the network tab. It has to be running while the like page is loading to actually get the dump of what's what resources are being loaded. So it's very useful because now I can see all the resources this web page is using. And then you can sort by uh, type here and then I can look for and the, really the key thing you're looking for, maybe I need to resort it. Key thing you're looking for here is JSON, which is not showing up, interesting. Ah, right there. Right, so you're looking for JSON. So this is the like internal API endpoint that McDonald's has set up for their nutrition data. So this is like, that's the gold, right? That's what, that's what you want. So um, you basically just gotta like, it's pretty simple at that point. You just kind of copy it. Make sure it's actually the right one. Yeah, so get item details at HTML, perfect. And then you can just, you know, uh, kind of, I mean, you can pretty much just, just shove that straight into your like uh, request. And then now I've got access to, um, to McDonald's nutrition information. So, uh, sorry, response dot. Okay. Yeah, so now you've got a nice JSON uh, file and you can just read that like a dictionary in Python and it's super simple. Um, cool, I'm just gonna breeze through the rest of this stuff. Um, so yeah, if you can use an API, uh, that's a little bit more polite. Um, there's a robots.txt file, it's pretty much located at every like root uh, website. So you go like mcdonalds.com slash robots.txt and it'll tell you like what they do and don't allow. Most of them don't let you scrape like login pages, for example. Um, it's really polite to identify yourself as a user agent so that if you're hammering someone's site, they can like send you an email and be like, hey, please, <laughs> please stop uh, dosing my site. Um, and yeah, just you know, be careful about site performance. Um, Scraping Hub uses, I think, a like delay of 12 seconds per request on a website. So if you want to be like really cautious, I would use something like that. Um, 
look it up and make your own decision. Um, I'm just going to just cover some like, you know, these are the things you can use to scrape. So some people use request and beautiful soup. Selenium. Scrapey. I use Scrapey because I, I have a lot of more complicated use cases and it's useful. So, yeah, so um, it's got really good documentation. Um, it's a little more complicated. It's like very complicated. And it's kind of like Django. It uses a lot of like classes and stuff, which like I'm not a huge fan of pattern wise. But um, overall, it's got pretty much everything you want. And it's got a lot of things to help you um, make sure you're not violating kind of the best practices of web scraping. So it already has built in uh, like caching so that um, caching and like URL duplicate uh, detection. So it won't uh, hit the same URL multiple times if you accidentally grab it multiple times. Um, it's caching is pretty sophisticated. I think you can actually like look at the, the response headers and determine that, that it's already downloaded it. Uh, I think it uses a, um, a head type of request to determine if that resource has already been loaded. Um, so more sophisticated caching than most people would implement on their own. Uh, it's got XPath support, which I like. And I, and I think Scrapey shell is a really good way to get into Scrapey. Uh, that's the thing I was just using earlier. You can just hit a, a single web, a web page with it and uh, inspect the response. Uh, using Scrapey itself is a lot more complicated. You have to define a class as like a spider and, and it's a lot more overhead. But I think Scrapey shell is a good way to get into Scrapey, kind of dip your toes. And if you like that, maybe go for the overall uh, library uh, when you're ready to build an actual like crawler. Um, they've got a commercial option. Uh, we use our own cloud because we have like, I don't know, like a bunch of credit on Amazon for startups. So, uh, and you're gonna do that. You're gonna want like Tmux because uh, uh, when you, uh, you know, leave SSH is gonna kill your process. So you make sure you have something that's gonna keep it running. And um, I use Fabric. It was super good. I don't know if anyone's used Fabric, but it's able to deploy uh, too many machines uh, to do something. So, yeah, uh, that's it. I don't know if I have like a minute for questions. Joe? No? Okay. Is there any, any questions? Uh, I used to use uh, Scrapey XPath, yeah, to use Scrapey XPath and Selenium for a more dynamic site. But that was the Coca Cola example. So, if by dynamic site you're talking about um, something with, like, like someone using React, for example, or so for, so for someone using like React, I would actually look at the network tab and I'd like to see what JSON is being fetched from the, the internal server. Um, that's usually your better way and then you're not just loading a bunch of extra resources that they don't, that you don't care about and they don't want to serve you. Um, but that being said, um, yes, you can use Selenium. It's a little bit slower. Um, Scrapey or Scraping Cloud provides something called Splash, which is free, you can run it yourself. Um, and I, I have resources in the in the slideshow, um, but that will also do uh, kind of it's, it's like Selenium Lite. It'll still do some rendering of uh, it'll it'll run JavaScript and render some of the resources. It just can't do as things like clicking buttons as easily as Selenium would. But for scraping, I think that's really all you need is just getting that page to load uh, with the JavaScript initially. So that would be my recommendation is. Um, Maybe use Splash instead. Look into that, or just look at the JSON from the response uh, from the network tab directly. Um, and you can usually look at the uh, request URI to to see how to modify that. So I guess maybe that wasn't clear, but at the McDonald's example, they probably got some sort of like internal ID for their Coca Cola. Um, that internal ID will probably be on the um, element of the Coke div somewhere, so like maybe where it says Coca-Cola as the product, it'll probably have an ID for what that product is. And that's going to be how you're going to um, use that JSON endpoint. You're going to start modifying that ID to be equal to the divs you scrape. Um, so, so it is still useful to use Scrapey, even if you have a JSON endpoint, you're going to want to probably get the internal IDs a different way. Uh, <laughs> so. Anything cool. else? Good. More, more questions? Anyone? Cool. Cool. Thank you very much, Kevin. Yep.